Uh, welcome everybody. This is um, our regular council meeting for Tuesday 21st of, 1st of April 2020 being held in our uh, main council chamber. East Gippsland Shire Council live streams, records and publishes its meetings via webcasting to enhance the accessibility of its meetings to the broader East Gippsland community. These recordings are also archived and available for viewing by the public or used for publicity or information purposes. At the appropriate times during the meeting, any public questions or requests to speak to an agenda item which was submitted prior to the council meeting will be recorded, including pre-recorded videos and comments. No other person has the right to record council meetings unless approval has been granted by the chair. Under the direction of the chief health officer, and the Department of Health and Human Services requirements limiting the number of people at public gatherings, Council will be conducting a closed door meeting to ensure Council are abiding by the social distancing regulations. So to begin, um, we regret that members of the public are not permitted to attend this meeting due to discretions issued under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act 2008 to contain the spread of COVID-19. Members of the public are invited to view the council meeting live streamed by following the link on council's website or Facebook page. Before I acknowledge the Gunai Kurnai people, I would like to acknowledge the councillors of made themselves available in order for us to conduct this meeting and thank them very much for their efforts. Um, as you will see, if you're watching the live stream, you will see the social distancing. And I'd also like to thank the council officers and our CEO for the fact that um, they have completely sanitised the area um, and are following the procedures set down by the health officer. Um, because it is very important that we can maintain these meetings due to the fact that we are following on from our bushfire crisis and there are so many important issues that we need to get out and up and going. So on behalf of Council, I would like to acknowledge the Gunai Kurnow people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered and pay our respects to their elders both past and present. And Mr CEO, we have apologies. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. We have apologies from Councillor Roberts and Councillor Buckley. Um, I think it is also appropriate to just note that um, Councillor Ellis is not in the room with us today, um, but is uh, participating in the discussion within the council meeting, uh, not, not part of the voting, but in discussion uh, of via being online video conferencing. Thank you, Mr CEO. Uh, do we have any declarations of conflict of interest? Uh, none have been received, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Our confirmation of the minutes from our ordinary council meeting held on the 17th of March to be confirmed with, with a correction to the Local Government Act reference in item 7.2, clause 2. The resolution should read section 186, brackets 5, brackets C, rather than section 185, bracket 5, bracket C. Could we have... Uh, Thank you, Councillor Peltz and Councillor Rotino. All those in favour? Uh, thank, thank you. No, we still have a quorum, and that's that's uh, five. And uh, um, Councillor O'Connell was was not here, so not able to vote. Our next ordinary council meeting will be on the 5th of May 2020 to be held at the Corporate Centre at 273 Main Street, Bansdale, commencing at 6pm. So hopefully before then, the Victorian Government has announced it is bringing a Bill to Parliament on the 23rd of April 2022 to enable council meetings to be conducted virtually. Subject to the parliamentary process, changes will be made to provide a mechanism in the Local Government Act 2020 for meetings to be conducted virtually. These changes, if passed, will come into operation on May 1, so, so therefore we will have probably um, a new set of rules regarding uh, remote viewing and being allowed to vote um, remotely rather than being in person as we are today. Um, do we have any requests for leave of absence, Mr CEO? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. No, no leave. Um of absence requests. 
again, just to, just to reiterate that a councillor is able to put in an apology for a meeting. It is only an extended period where leave of uh, absences are, requests are required. Thank you. Uh, item 1.7 is request to speak about your community project. Do we have any requests? There are, there are none, Mr Mayor. 1.8 is uh, public question time. Um, I suggest to, um, that we, we go to that now. Do we have any requests for public question time? Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. We actually have uh, a number of uh, public questions that have been asked, uh, in particular in relation to item um, 1.10, the petition declaring a climate emergency. Um, so uh, unless, uh, unless I have any direction from Council, um, I'm happy to go through uh, those questions now. Some of them um, are all of a similar um, vein, um, but I think it's important to recognise the individual contributors even um, uh, even though some of the questions may not be required because they are repetitive. Uh, the other part is that given that uh, the general managers are, are online and not here with us, um, it is appropriate that we provide a written response um, back, to, back to the people that have submitted a question rather than seeking to try and answer it over the, uh, over the um, virtual um, the video conferencing mechanism. So if, if councillors are comfortable with that, I'm, I'm happy to, to go through the questions, um, but we would uh, then provide a written response to all submitters. Councillors, councillors, are we in agreement? Yeah. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. CEO. All right. You may you may uh, wish to read through your list. Okay, so these are are, are are being read in the order in which they have been received. Um, Tom Moore of Meetung asks. Firstly, I applaud Council for steps already taken to identify and mitigate against climate uh, risk in East Gippsland. However, with climate science clearly predicting substantial increases in the frequency and intensity of bushfires, especially on our eastern coastline, could Council explain why it does not consider we have a climate emergency? A written response will be provided. Mendy Yuri of Eagle Point has asked a question in relation again to 1.10.1. Council officers are recognising that the, that the movement of councils to declare climate emergency initiated by the Darabin Council has been and is an important one in amplifying the need for urgent action globally across business communities and all levels of the environment. Why then do officers not recommend that East Gippsland add its name to the long list. After a tragic summer of bushfires, when Australia and East Gippsland were clearly a focus of the world, the world's horrified attention, won't we attract, sorry, won't we attract a deserved ridicule by appearing to deny the seriousness of what climate science is telling us? The written response will be provided. John Urey from Bansdale, also in relation to um, the climate emergency um, petition. I've read the I've read the executive summary document number eight four two two three nine one in response to the petition declaring climate emergency. The response from council officers. You'll have to excuse me, the writing is difficult to, to read here. Officers' concerns um, concentrate, sorry, on adoption and mitigation, but does not address the possible benefit of declaring a climate emergency. An added voice to the rising voices to enable, enable real change uh, to emissions that are only p possible if a state federal level. Please. Please can this fun can you please consider, I think it is, this fundamental question. A typed one, this should be easier. Um, from Don Ashby of Malakuta. 
How can Shire reconcile its support for the commencements oh, this is of gold extractive industries in Genoa Walliga River catchments when it is de its declared support for mitigation of climate change consequences and responsible environmental policies? Again, we will provide a written response to that, which I just should note um, for the record does then appear in the, in the minutes um, of the meeting. That was from Don Ashby of Mallacoota. A second question, which is allowed uh, by, also by Don Ashby of Mallacoota. In the light of the current draft of climate change policies, have not significantly, if in the light of that, the current draft of climate change policies have not significantly, excuse me, affected the council's continued support for high carbon emission industries like extractive industries, mass tourism, and unsustainable agricultural practices, surely the adoption of a climate emergency declaration is timely and highly necessarily to, necessary to reflect genuine policy changes to attempt to mitigate climate change change's primary cause in our Shire. Um, it seems a bit like, more like a statement than a question, but we will provide a response. Uh, this is from a G. Johnston, Johnston of Walper. Whilst Council's environmental sustainability strategy to protect, preserve and enhance East Gippsland's environment, including actions to mitigate and, and adapt to climate change, will Council's assessment of future strategic and statutory projects cons consider scrutiny of any project within the Shire that would have the potential to compromise our sustainability, landscape and natural resources leaving the community and council with unacceptable legacy of environmental impacts, costly mitigations and ameliorizations for present and future generations in making these judgments. This is from Andrew and Anne Therese McGregor of Painesville. In the context of three years of drought and its devastating bushfires of 2019-20 in the East Gippsland Council, is, sorry, is the East Gippsland Council comfortable with its current, I'm not sure what that, that, those words are, um, something about policies, um, whom we clearly need to be, where we clearly need to be proactive in the face of this existent, Existential, existential. Thank you. Um, threat to climate change. That feels also a bit like a comment. However, we will provide a response. There is a second question in um, from Andrew and Anne McGregor, and I apologise to them if they're listening. That if I haven't quite uh, articulated this as they um, would have liked. The second question is: When the council's environment and sustainability strategy is updated. Will it recognise that protecting our environment is crucial for the region's health, prosperity, jobs and tourism? And I can add that that um, strategy is currently um, being updated. Um, Jim Sarkis from Mallacoota. Is the East Gippsland Shire Council willing to be part of the movement for councils declaring a climate emergency as, initi as initiated by the Darabin Council? to send a message to our community and to the rest of the world that urgent action on climate is crucial to our survival and that business as usual is no longer an option. Question from Jenny Mason, of also of Mallacoota. East Gippsland has recently suffered extensive drought and bushfires. There is no doubt that the climate change is affecting our lives and livelihoods. If we care about the future of our land, our people and our wildlife, Strong action is required now. Will East Gippsland Shire Council declare a climate emergency along with other forward-thinking councils? Will the council act in a strong, united way and lead the East Gippsland to a sustainable, livable future? Well, I believe that matter is being debated today by the council. There is uh, also from, um, this is from the Malaguda Progress Association. It's a, it's a lengthy email that has been circulated to all councillors. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but there is, um, there is a question at the start, which I think um, is, is sort of, then there is 
material that supports that question. So the question reads, with your officials asking you to bury your heads in the sand um, over the emergencies we have faced and will have faced and will continue to face at our change, our question on behalf of the members is why? Rosemary Gooch of Nicholson. In view of the many strategies already undertaken by the Shire Council and with the review of the environmental sustain sustainability strategy review being undertaken, will the Shire take the opportunity to take a leadership role on the issue by declaring a climate emergency? So as you see, councillors, there are a number of questions which are very similar um, around um, the contents of the report that's being presented later. Um, I have a few more, I'll keep going. Uh, this one from Robin Hermans, I think it is, from the East Gippsland Climate Action Network. The East Gippsland Climate Action Network represents a large number of residents deeply concerned about the urgency in addressing the safety of our climate. The November 2017 Take Two Pledge acknowledged East Gippsland Shire's commitment to tackling climate change. We now have an opportunity to extend rather than duplicate our commitment by demonstrating solidarity with others globally in ensuring expediency in our responses. Will you also sign up for the safety of the people and places we love? Um, so that, that one was on behalf of the East Gippsland Action Network. This one is on behalf of an individual from Clifton Creek, Robin Hermans. Scientists advise that this is the decade where our choices and actions will determine the safety of the people and places we love into the future. We, I believe it is time to move into an emergency mode just as we have done for the pandemic. Can councillors agree that it is time to extend their pledge, commitment and declaration to a climate emergency? I believe that item will also be debated later. Daniel Haylock of Bansdale. My question includes background information as well as the question. I've attached the printed copy. So there is some, um, some preamble here which I, which I won't read. Um, my question is, like Canberra, is the East Gippsland Shire Council looking to ensure that all future buildings and housing estates are fully electric? This means electric stoves, electric hot water and electric heating instead of gas as a way of supporting our transition away from fossil fuels. This one from Kay Munro of Flynn's Road. Um, I'm assuming that's Flynn's Road Eastwood, unless there's another Flynn's Road, which is possible. Thank you. As the request for council to declare a climate emergency over the Shire is to be considered, my question is this. In the interest of transparent leadership and an era of rampant opinions, could council please make public the reasons for its decisions, whatever that may be, over the declaration of a climate emergency for the Shire? This one is from uh, Dr. Jane Grishin and David Campbell of Bansdale. Again, I hope that I can do um, this writing justice. Whilst acknowledging the East Gippsland Shire Council's stated commitment to reducing the impacts of climate change, unless the council takes the next step of declaring a climate emergency, how can the community know that the council will do everything possible to mitigate the rapidly progressive impact of climate change on public health, infection rates, sanitation, poor air quality, impact on chronic diseases, including lung, heart, and autoimmune diseases, and cancer, adequate and safe water supply. I do have a, a final question here. Un unfortunately, we haven't been able to get um, authorization to read it out, but uh, it is from Judy Island of Clifton Creek, um, and it would be fair to say that's in a similar vein to the questions that I've just read. Um, but given that I haven't got authorization to read it, I, I won't read that at this point in time. 
Um, thank you, Mr. CEO. Could you just please elaborate on why there wouldn't be authorisation for to read that out? Is that a request from the the submitter, or is it not signed, or, or something along those lines? Uh, no, it is. It is signed. Uh, however, all the other all the other um, people we've been able to, given the unique circumstances in which we're working today, um, we have been able to contact everyone else to get authorisation from for myself to read it, which is the normal process. If a person has to give permission if they're not able to attend for the CEO to read out their, their question, um, which is our standard practice. On, on this occasion, we haven't been able to do it. Um, I'm not going to die in a ditch over it, um, but, I, but I, I feel that I haven't got the, the, the authorization to do it um, from the submitter. Um, but it will be in the minutes, uh, and there will be a written response in the minutes as well. So it won't be lost. It just won't, it's not being read out today, that's all. No, thank you. That's that's a that's a, a very good response, and I'm um, hopefully that they'll be satisfied with that. All right, that's it. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. So we have um, 1.9.1, which is our assemblies of councillors from February to April. So this um, this would be uh, endorsed by Mr. Canazaro. Would you like to um, speak to this? This item, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. In our um, normal reporting, we present council with the assemblies of council laws. Um, I take it that the report's been read. Uh, you will note that um, we have yet to include the council briefing um, notes at this stage because we haven't performed the quality check on those notes yet, but that will be in the next update. So look at Certainly. Mr. Canazero, am I on yet? Um, I did pick up in these notes that the 14th of April was not current in the Assembly of Councillors in the Councillor Briefing section. And I did ring in earlier um, to find out, could it be quickly added, that there was an, um, a response from the ladies that take the minutes that stated that um, they hadn't been confirmed um, for that date, whilst I note they're actually in the councillor only time section, um, the minutes haven't been confirmed in the councillor briefing section. So um, they, I presume they'll come to the council next month or next time we meet. But I just wanted the other councillors to be aware that that was something that was, I picked up this morning and that they should be aware of, that, um, that it wasn't included, but it will be next time. Thank you. Yep, through you, Mr Mayor, that's right. Thank you. So would that require an amendment at this stage? No, okay, thank you, Councillor Peltz. Now, um, Councillor Rutino was, um, was going to move that and Councillor uh, Reeves was seconding it. So all those in favour? Thank you, Councillors, that's unanimous. So that moves us to petitions and we have at 1.10.1 uh, our petition declaring a climate emergency. Um, so this has um, been endorsed by um, our uh, General Manager of Assets and Environment, uh, Ms Weigel. Um, would you wish to, to um, speak to this? Thank you, Mr Mayor. The report before you not only um, receives the petition from the 1,649 petition signatories, but also provides a response to the petition. Um, I would just note before I get into summarising the report that we haven't provided an, um, a petition as an attachment to this um, report, recognising and protecting the privacy of those that have signed the um, petitions. However, that um, petition has been um, circulated under separate cover to all councillors. The um, petition generally asks for the council to consider doing three things. To take strong leader, a strong leadership role within council, um, within the East Gippsland community for urgent action on climate change. To include in all reports to council climate implications for council's own operations and um, to declare a climate emergency. Um, as the report outlines, council has recognised climate change in its work and its strategies for a number of years. This includes um, signing up to the Take Two um, Victorian Government Initiative, um, implementing actions in the environmental strategy that we currently work to, 
and a range of projects that in include um, climate change mitigation actions, most notably the suite of Bright Futures projects, where we've seen investment of over $5 million over the past five years. As well as the, um, these particular projects, we've also had a strong advocacy role, both locally through our um, initiatives such as the Environment Connect e-newsletter and a range of other locally based awareness and education campaigns. And also on a state and national basis where we regularly respond to council, um, on behalf of council to policy and other parliamentary inquiries. The most recent of these indeed was in late 2019 where council responded to a parliamentary inquiry into tackling climate change. And we also hosted a hearing of that um, inquiry here in Bairnsdale and also showed um, the parliamentary committee some of the impacts of climate change here in East Gippsland. Not resting on our laurels in this space, we are also looking at how we make sure that we can continue to embed um, responses to climate change and climate change is an important issue in our future work. Officers are currently reviewing our environmental strategy and have seen fit to make sure that one of the three key themes or pillars of this strategy, which will have a 10 year life, is around climate change. This will continue to guide Council's internal and leadership roles and also our projects and our own investments on, in our own work. Um, given this, we're also looking at other initiatives such as um, green purchasing power and electronic vehicles. So whilst we haven't to date declared a climate emergency, I think we can see that Council's work very much recognises the importance of climate change and has responded accordingly. We are in fact seen, often seen as a leader in this field amongst um, like councils across Victoria. If we return to the petition and the requests that are made within it, um, the, res the recommendation that is before council this afternoon makes three key recommendations to respond to those, um, re those three requests of the petition. The first is that Council continues to show a strong leadership role in recognising climate change in future strategic work and ensuring that there are specific actions and projects undertaken to support the East Gippsland community adopt, and I'm sorry, adapt to climate change and mitigate impacts wherever possible. We're also recommending that Council includes a specific climate change section within Council report templates so that climate implications for Council operations and for the broader East Gippsland community are considered in all recommendations to Council and that would be about across all levels of Council work. And we're also recommending that Council recognise that a change in climate is a matter of serious concern for the East Gippsland community. And in addition to the organisational response to climate change, Council advocate to other tiers of government to take assertive action that will support our community and our landscape to mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change. So councillors, whilst this report does not go so far as to suggest we um, declare a climate emergency, the requests that are being made within this petition are really about the actions that we take and the actions that sit behind such a declaration. And we believe that it's possible to take those actions and we are taking those actions and will continue to take those actions regardless of whether there's a climate emergency declared or not. I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weigel. Um, before I take, um, offer questions around the room, I'd possibly, um, Councillor Ellis, because I can't see him put his hand up, I would invite Councillor Ellis first if you would uh, have any questions. Uh, can yeah. you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Uh, that's, that's better, thank you. Yes, you were not coming yeah. through, but you are now. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Wurgle, do we, uh, are we, uh, compliant as a council with the state climate change legislation that directs actions of local government and the state for that matter to to address the issues of climate change. Thank you, uh, councillor. Uh, most certainly we comply with legislation and in fact we also do a number of voluntary, um, undertake a number of voluntary actions that not all councils undertake. One of those was signing up to the Take Two um, 
commitment, a uh, statement of commitment to um, climate change, which was about taking two degrees off, off climate. Um, and we also um, undertake a range of projects that we seek funding from the state government and federal government for that are in line with the policy and the commitments of those levels of government. So I can say quite assuredly that yes, we do follow those commitments and, and abide by those um, guidelines set by other levels of government. Thank you. Uh, one second question, if I may, Mr. Mayor, and that is um, to Ms. Weigel. Um, acknowledging that we live in a fairly conservative area, can you give us some examples of how Council is leading in the adaption to climate change and encouraging members of our community to come on board? Sure, I'll, I'll refer back to the Bright Futures project that we undertook. It had a, a range of sub-projects that sat within it. So we undertook it, we sought funding, it was competitive funding from the federal government, um, invested over $3 million in addressing um, energy consumption across council buildings and our street lights um, so we could reduce our own carbon footprint and, um, re and be a leader and demonstrate to council, to council um, community members how we could undertake this work. We also ran a, ra a stage two of this. We, um, ran a range of projects where, which were actually identified and targeted at the community. There's a lot of awareness raising around use of solar and um, how to get the best outcomes of that. And we actually led a um, collaborative purchasing arrangement um, which allowed our community members to access solar at a much lower rate. We, ran, we run a whole lot of um, newsletters. We have a whole lot of documents about how to embed um, mitigation against um, energy use and other um, aspects of climate change into the building of homes and, and into um, general living. So I think that we have um, demonstrated that we are undertaking this on a regular basis. Good. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. The, the definition of emergency after having phase three over the past two years is a difficulty for us here in Council, I would think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Now, throw it open to uh, any, anyone around the table who'd like to uh, ask a question of uh, Swiss Weigel. Councillor Peltz. Uh, yes, Ms. Weigel, with regards to the recommendation, um, is there anything um, wording or complexity in um, any of the um, dot points there that actually commits the ratepayer to expenditure or excessive fund? Um, usage because um, I know with regards in the past to a lot of the things that we've done, um, the projects have been extremely costly um, in regards to environmental, um, you know, addressing issues, um, be it the sea wall, walls down at um, Lakes Entrance, $30 million, be it the, um, the Bright Futures project, $3 million to address um, the um, carbon footprint of the um, council. I'm just suggesting in mind to my fellow colleagues that um, there may be underlying um, costly factors that our community um, may not be able to wear the brunt of. I'm just curious if there's anything that holds us um, with regards to, um, you know, declaring this area a climate emergency in dot point C of one, um, whether that actually um, holds us to ransom on having to um, pay expenditure um, unnecessarily. Thank you, Councillor. The recommendation um, in recommendation 1.C is, re is merely that we recognise the, um, the petition and the three um, requests of the, that petition. It doesn't mean we're actually asking Councillor to declare a climate emergency. In terms of the costs of projects and the costs of climate change mitigation, all projects come with a cost. Um, this report doesn't actually commit Council to um, any costs or any commitment of future funding. What it does say in the financial section of the report is that you know, petition, um, projects would be identified and taken through our normal business planning and budgeting process. And wherever we could, we would be seeking external funding from other tiers of government to help offset that cost. As you've rightly pointed out, some of the, um, the mitigation and adaptation measures that we're undertaking at the moment, like the um, replacing and raising of seawalls in our coastal towns, are very costly. So this, this report itself doesn't commit council to any costs. 
it just it merely um, indicates that those projects would have to be considered on balance when we're adopting budgets and business um, plans and council plans for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Councillor Rutino. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ms. Weigel, I was just wanted to um, clarify that the current recommendation before us uh, will enable us to work with uh, organisations like uh, Food Innovation Australia Limited or FIAL uh, with, the, um, with the work that we want to do, um, certainly in reducing waste and reducing CO2 emissions. Um, they have uh, got the food industry focused on uh, food waste and their um, strategic plan is to halve food waste by 2030. Um, interestingly, uh, $20 billion a year is the figure that goes against food waste in Australia. And interestingly, half of that is household waste, $10 billion. Mm -hmm. So for every 7.6 million tonnes of CO2 generated annually from this waste, it continues to generate that CO2 for the full life of its decay. So I'd like to uh, have assurance that we're going to collaboratively work with organisations like FIAL if we're going to um, get ahead of the game. Absolutely. Um, you're quite right, Councillor. Methane is a really um, big contributor to climate change and um, it's something that we need to address and have started addressing. So this report um, gives us the opportunity to continue to build those partnerships and um, seek those um, external funding and, and partners as required to turn those concepts into a reality. So this report is not suggesting for one moment that we don't action um, and take action against um, on the to address climate change. This report is um, suggesting that we've already been doing that and that we would continue to do that. And there are some ways that we can continue to show and strengthen our leadership role and also make sure that we've got a very strong advocacy role, recognising the seriousness of this um, matter and the importance of the matter um, to our local community. So this, will, this report will strengthen our commitment to uh, the work that we're already doing and the future work that is um, available to us and the future partnerships that will be available to us to ensure that we continue to take um, steps to mitigate um, against climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weigel. Um, any other questions, councillors? Okay, would somebody like to uh, um, move this um, recommendation? Councillor Tui, seconded by Councillor Reeves. Uh, Councillor Tui, you may wish to speak to the recommendation. Uh, just shortly, Mr Mayor. Um, I did notice um, in um, the recommendation one point, oh, correction, uh, in recommendation point three, uh, it refers to uh, including a specific climate change section within council report templates so that climate implications for council operations and for the broader East Gippsland community are considered in all recommendation to council, which I think is, is, uh, is a good step forward in regards to um, uh, both ourselves and our community being able to see um, what, what effect uh, any of the recommendations that are put to us and any of the decisions that we make, um, what effect it does have on our, um, on our climate. So I, I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Thank you, uh, Councillor Reeves. Oh, thanks, Mayor. I've just got to reach across over here, and so I'm not a social distance away from the microphone. Councillors, um, firstly, I'd just like to thank and applaud the petitioners for the work that they've done and uh, acknowledge the fact that there's um, been a lot of people behind this and the initiators as well. It's important, but I'd add um, from my own perspective in a community scan, some focus group work that I've done, uh, acknowledge there's a perception that there may be many emergencies in our community at the moment. Um, COVID-19 is a social emergency as a result of that. Educational, parenting emergencies if you're trying to educate kids at home, travel and tourism emergency, mental health emergencies as a result of isolation, there's a business emergency, there's an economic emergency, an investment emergency, a medical provision emergency and so on. 
And I just want to explain this for the benefit of those who are watching, and I know there's many interested parties. It's, um, the risk is that if we adopt the term climate emergency, it becomes a pejorative term. And when it becomes a pejorative term, it has the risk of driving people away. And what we're trying to do with this petition and as a council is actually unite people behind the cause. The terminology is really, really important. So I just want to reassure the petitioners and those who are watching and ask the, the remit of council who are going to hopefully support this, that this should be a process that glues us together. And the wording is really important to glue us together. And to reassure everyone that the actions that council take, and these are councillors' words. I there's been a number of questions that are suggesting the officers have put this together. This is the work of councillors who have asked the officers to draft this for us on our behalf. So this, this is our words. It's where the rubber hits the road that really counts. And we don't want words that ring hollow unless we can demonstrate we do something, councillors. And I think that everything that is asked of us in this petition, we have put in place and we will be putting in place. And we'll hold the CEO and the officers to account to put them in place. That's what's important. And it is important that we address climate change. And we will continue to do that, to do that as a council now with renewed vigour and vim and take action. We'll shine a light on the dark areas in our organisation where we can do better and we will view everything we do with a view to mitigating climate impact. Councillors, it really takes us a long way and I hope that you'll support this motion as it stands now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reeves. Uh, Councillor Feltz, you'd uh, wish to speak yes, for or I against? Um, I'm, I'm speaking against because I, I've, in this issue, I, um, I'm in a quandary here because I'm actually in support of everything that's been noted other than the fact that the climate emergency because I find myself um, not wanting to sensationalise the fact that we have climate evolution or climate... Um, they, they might not be even climatic issues, they're just the fact that this is how our life is now. So to me it's more an evolution than a dramatic um, emergency. Like Councillor Reeves said, we have a lot of emergencies on our table at the moment and I don't want our region to be um, on the bandwagon of, of the sensationalism. I don't disagree that everything that's um, around us doesn't need to be um, addressed. I'm saying that um, the bushfire issue it, it has serious um, consequences. The economic issues have serious consequences as do the health issues. Everything is a, of equal importance or is not more. One's not more important than the other. And I really um, feel for our staff at the moment because they're doing a sensational job as is our CEO. They're addressing as much as um, what they can. But I actually think in regards to the, um, you know, the climate um, action that our staff has taken in the past has been um, has been um, leader of the pack. We've actually addressed, you know, a lot of the things by, um, you know, even introducing the community solar schemes. You know, the initiative where you could actually have your place, um, you know, discounted with the solar energy systems. Um, you know, I think we've been really innovative for our community, and I don't think just because this group's come to us and they're jumping up and down and being a bit sort of, um, and I don't mean to offend when I say this, but a radical environmental passion about it all. I think um, the fact is there's a lot happening in our community and I do want to support this, but I actually don't want them, the group to be thinking by us saying, by misleading that we're actually receiving this petition, that we're actually supporting the fact that we're declaring a climate emergency for our region because I think that's the sensation, the one sensational part of the whole argument that I disagree with. I think it's actually something um, that we are addressing and I think our officers are doing a good job and I think, yes, um, our action, our emergency um, policies will always be something that we're looking at and addressing and upgrading as do all our policies, but I don't specifically see the, the, the issue of the climate emergency being um, a, a, you know, a driver of this whole thing. I, I believe there's issues that need to be addressed. As Joe said about the, um, 
the food waste and the, um, you know, all of those things, but then, you know, maybe we should all be gluten-free too, so that might help with the methane issue. So, in regards to that, that's all I'd like to say, Mr Mayor. Um, th thank you, Councillor Peltz. Anybody else wishing to speak for or against uh, Councillor Rotuno? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm speaking for the uh, motion that's before us um, and re reinforce the comments made by Councillor Reeves. It's only through collaboration that you get sustainable change. Uh, trying to drive change any other way, um, you have plenty of false starts and you don't get to the end. But uh, I'd like us to adopt the um, FIAL logo, which is love food, hate food waste. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tui, you have the right of reply. Would you like to uh, add any more? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. <coughs> um, whilst I, I listened to uh, Councillor Peltz, and I agree with some of, uh, some of what Councillor Peltz says, um, I, the reality is we're not declaring a climate emergency. And I would like to think that, uh, that the recommendation is going to allow the spotlight uh, to be placed on what we have done and what we are doing moving forward. And I think, as uh, Councillor Reeves said, if we can take people along with us, that's the best way uh, to address the, the issue that we have. And there is no uh, denying we have a climate issue, but we need all people on board to be able to move it forward. So I think this is, is a very good recommendation and uh, one that I hope uh, will gain plenty of support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tui. So councillors will put this to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you, councillors. So that, <coughs> excuse me, that councillors leads us to um, to uh, our notices of motion and or rescission. Uh, none have been received, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Deferred business? There is none, Mr Mayor. All right, then that brings us to our councillor and delegate reports. So, um, councillors, I'll, I'll start with Councillor Tui. Would you like to uh, give us a brief report, monthly report? Uh, it'll be very brief because I don't have one. I haven't been able to get out, so I don't have one. Thanks, Councillor O'Connell. Have you been able to get out? Uh, uh, thanks, Mr Mayor. No, um, and this is my first meeting back since my leave of absence. Um, only one thing to report on, which was a, a um, phone hookup we had yesterday for the drought reference group. Um, well, we just received some updates on the impact of the drought and the bushfires on the farming community across East Gippsland and spoke about the Ag Futures work that is um, happening, which will work in conjunction with the Looking Ahead proposal, and then a discussion around the transition of the Drought Reference Group uh, to a more general Agricultural Advisory Committee. Thank you. Councillor Rotino. No, Mr Mayor, I don't have a, um, a formal report, but I was wondering if I could put to you that um, we might um, change our start of our meetings by reaffirming or reading out uh, our values, um, the council or values in our code of conduct uh, around accountability, inclusion, integrity, respect and resourceful resourcefulness. I think it would uh, be a nice way to start our council meetings if we reaffirmed our commitment to the community. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Rotino, and that would be duly noted in the minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor, and uh, maybe you could put that as a, a motion at some stage in future, Councillor Rotino. Uh, I won't read my report, I'll just submit it uh, with a view to expediency and minimising our contact time today. Thank you. Well said, Councillor Reeves. Um, Councillor Peltz? I uh, just have a couple of things, if I may. The rural councils, I just wanted to inform everyone um, that um, Marianne Brown, our um, executive, our chair, has been um, active in that space in regards to the meeting um, off line meeting um, commitments, as have our um, executive officers. Um, and just to say that um, it's being reiterated not only at the MAV level, but also at rural councils and um, at our council level as well. So um, there was also some um, good information for seats coming through with um, the local announcements of um, our Honourable Darren Chester, um, which was um, great to see some of the work that the seats group had done um, in 
the on the Princess Highway um, campaign that we had, which started with a petition too, so you don't really know where it's going to grow to, um, but to see some of that um, action now coming into play and some great funding coming towards safety upgrades for our community, but we did ask could it not go towards more um, barriers on the Princess Highway because they seem to be not as <laughs> as appreciated as others, although the statistics are good and um, Vic Roads will argue that they're being effective and that they're serving the purpose. So um, the MAV transport um, was cancelled, that meeting was cancelled. And I just wanted to say the last thing was the bushfire, um, the Orbos bushfire recovery group is struggling to um, get its action <coughs> in regards to who's going to be on the committee. And um, I, I just sort of wanted to um, say that if there's anyone out there that's really keen to um, look into the, um, to develop the future of our region to get on board and contact that group so that we can have some positive input um, into the redevelopment of our region was all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peltz. Uh, Councillor Ellis, um, can you uh, still hear us? Would you like to give a, a brief report, please? Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I look up, uh, like Councillor Reeves, I, I'll submit a, a written report like everyone else, it's been very quiet over the last fortnight, uh, with many meetings being uh, uh, adjourned or even cancelled. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Um, my report will be quite brief too. It's, uh, it's just been a series of, um, of Skype meetings and telephone hookups, uh, but probably something that's, um, that's, that's come forward during this, this last little while is that our, one of our upper house members, um, the Honourable Jane Garrett, has been has been dialing in and um, and uh, concerned that through the pandemic that possibly the bushfire recovery could falling be falling off the page, which I would assure our community it is not. But uh, she's she's come forward to be an, um, an advocate for us and taking uh, many of our issues to um, to Parliament. So I thank thank her very much for that. And this will be an ongoing situation um, where, where she will be helping her constituents and making sure that if we have any problems, that she's uh, she's a good conduit to get that information right through to cabinet. Um, so thank you, councillors, for your reports. So that leads that leads us to um, 5.1.1, which is an interim policy, and it's temporary storage at premises impacted by bushfires. Now, it's authored by Stuart McConnell, and uh, and in attendance we have Aaron Hollow. So uh, immediately, um, would you like to speak to this first, um, Stuart? Yeah, I'll thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll give an introduction to the to the. Um policy and, and um, Mr Hollow is here if there's any uh, specific questions that we need to go to. Um, thank you for this opportunity. The, the document in front of you is in relation to an interim policy for the temporary storage at premises impacted by bushfire and, and this is an, in essence responding to a need and a request in the community for us to enable people who have lost either their house or major major storage um, buildings uh, in the fires to have some way of quickly re-establishing some storage on the property for either residual um, items from from the property or indeed for donated goods or or building materials those sorts of things and so um, the, this policy seeks to enable that in a proper an appropriate way and provides a range of options for that including um, shipping containers and the use of those where that's that's appropriate and also to um, enable and encourage use of um, temporary sheds or in fact to enable people to build the, the garage or shed ahead of the the, um, the house which is ordinarily not not what happens so in that way to provide those options for people to have storage in that that post bushfire so this is one thing where the normal um, arrangements and constraints under the planning system and under the uh, the provisions of the general local law would, would make this more difficult. But through this policy, uh, the intention is to enable those things to occur, and at the end through that to support our community um, that's been impacted by the fires through their recovery. So the the the, um, the interim policy seeks to enable this. Um, 
and to do so, um, we've set this quite deliberately with a an expiry date, and that is aligned with the same uh, time frames that have been set by the state government policy in relation to uh, temporary dwellings. So the, the the two pieces of work are aligned, and. Again, the, the policy sets out there are a range of options from off-site storage to, um, to use of sh uh, sheds on, on the block and, th and, and in some cases also the use of shipping containers and really recognising that that needs to be stepped through on a case by case. And where there are um, shipping containers used just to recognise that that's for a fixed period of time and there's some other measures that need to be in place to uh, manage some of the landscape and other amenity impacts that can occur and are one of the reasons why the controls are in place in the first place in relation to uh, to containers. So with that, um, you have the, the report and and the interim proposed interim policy uh, in front of you and the recommendation from officers that council approve this interim policy. Thank you. Um, again, I'll, I will actually um, Ask uh, Councillor Alice has he got a question for either uh, of the officers? One. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Perhaps if you could ask, um, pass it on to one of the other councillors and I'll come back to you. I do have a couple of questions. All right, councillors, uh, questions around the table. Okay, Councillor Peltz. Uh, yes, Stuart, if I may, um, I did raise the concern um, as you know, our family. My father's family business um, was um, import exports and I gave you a story about um, a client of theirs that um, had a container pulled up on the docks and he was told it was radioactive and he said, no, it's definitely not radioactive and they said, well, it's reading as radioactive um, and there was a contaminant um, residue in the bottom of that container and the guys... Um, products in this container um, were actually um, contaminated with this uh, dust that had been previously in the container and I was wondering, you did resolve it saying um, something about there's an accreditation or a stamp on the outside of the container. Um, so there is, yeah. So I was just wondering whether we were to confirm what that, that actual mark had to say so that it would be available to come into our region because it is a concern for me and I'd hate any of the people that are thinking, oh, this is um, a really great way to go to end up with a dud one and getting their whole furniture and everything contaminated because we hadn't done the research. Yeah, so um, we, we can provide that further information in the guidance that, that sits around this policy. We have included within the interim policy that, just to be clear, that it's the responsibility, of, particularly of the provider of the shipping container, to, to ensure that it is free from contamination and fit for purpose. And what we can do in some guidance associated with the policy is just to say, um, here's a mechanism by which that can occur. Um, I just um, would caution um, people in the public in the fact that um, shipping containers, uh, they have a use by date and you know often you see them in the marketplace and they're quite cheap to pick up. They might be two grand or five grand or something like that. And, um, just to be cautious of, you know, maybe the cheapest one isn't the best one, but to do some research and make sure that um, you're not ending up with one of those legacy containers. Thank you, Councillor Pelt. Some questions, uh, Councillor Tui. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Stuart, just in regards to um, uh, the amenity, um, uh, landscape amenity and neighbourhood character, um, will there be, uh, or, or could there potentially be um, uh, situations where we would not allow uh, the placement of a container on a property? Um, the, pol the policy as it currently stands does not um, set out circumstances where that would be prohibited. I, off, I can't think of one on, off the top of my head, but there may be a particular reason um, why that's possible, but the main circumstances that we um, are envisaging, where where really it's in the vicinity of the building that's been um, burnt down in in the fires, um, and is is one in which that in in 
the majority of circumstances I can imagine a container could be an option. However, in, in a lot of those cases, we'd also encourage um, other options to be explored as well. Um, because I, I have noticed that uh, you're talking about potentially allowing the building of a, or the replacement, uh, perhaps is a better word, of a, of a shed or a um, garage. So yep. if, um, is there some means by which we can guarantee that uh, once the shed's been built that the house will be built after that? Because I do understand that generally speaking, you cannot build a garage until you've built a house. Yeah, so ultimately what that comes back to is if someone um, builds a facility for storage um, and is not, it's not then forming part of a overarching residential use, um, albeit in, the, in this case that there might be some delay in bringing forward the house, if ultimately it is being used for storage in the long term, then uh, we'd seek to use the provisions of the planning scheme where uh, in residential zones, generally a store or a use as a store is not permitted, and then you've got the normal arrangements within the planning scheme for that. Thank you. Councillor Peltz, yes, um, if, if it's a, que a question happy? this time, yeah, more I than just, comment. Um, oh, the last one was a question, just had a happy ending. Um, can I just actually. Um, ask, I see that the policy is for a four year period. I just want to check that it will be um, reviewed within that time frame. But yeah, well, the policy doesn't currently have a, a specific uh, review clause in it, but we can ensure that it is reviewed within that period of time. Thank you. Now, Councillor Ellis, um, oh, thank you, you may it's have had a question. A, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Connell, um, it was just a, a follow on probably from Councillor Tui's question. And it was just uh, in relation to one of the points that you had in terms of permission of temporary storage. And that was in the short term where containers are used, they are to, are to be treated to reduce amenity impacts. I just wonder if you can clarify what the treatment is, is that is required and what so, are we looking at in terms of reduction of amenity impacts? So, so as you'd imagine that um, many containers are brightly painted and they're really obvious in the landscape when um, they're placed. There are some simple measures. They don't, they're not, they don't um, eliminate any impact, but they do reduce them. Probably the simplest measures are simply to paint it a, um, a, a suitably muted tone that blends to the landscape or um, planting vegetation. Good, thank you for that question. I answered uh, Mr. O'Connell. The second question I had is that um, the entire shire is dotted with some quite unseemly uh, containers in various yards and used for varying purposes. Um, will, we, will we, as Council, take into account um, a potential demand for more containers in the region, be relaxing the enforcement of uh, our local laws in relation to the use of uh, containers. Um, so the, 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 the approach in relation to the ongoing, um, our ongoing approach to management of containers on other properties um, is not proposed to change and the, um, at this stage. And, and so some provisions have, you know, clearly through this interim policy are proposed in relation to um, those properties where there has been um, direct fire impact, but we're, we're concerned we're concerned to, to ensure that, in general, the, same, the provisions typically <laughs> elsewhere in the Shire are retained. Thank you for that. Um, so, councillors, um, would somebody like to move? Okay, this is uh, moved by Councillor Reeves, the second in Councillor O'Connell. So, um, Councillor Reeves, you might like to say a few words. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, councillors. Uh, this is a good policy. It's, um, I think it'll address some of the needs that some of our community members have at the moment, but it also has some good provisions in there so that we don't have this legacy, as Councillor Alice mentioned, of unsightly um, containers dotted across the landscape. 
Uh, so as long as we can make sure and ensure that in future we don't have those legacy um, blights on the landscape, this otherwise is a great policy and moves us forward. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Reeves. Councillor O'Connell. I would just add that, yeah, I think it's important that we get this through um, and to help support our bushfire affected community. Thanks to the officers for getting this uh, work done. Here, here, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak for or against? For. Thank you, Councillor um, Tui. Good policy, well thought out um, and good for the community. All right. I think we could put that to the vote. Councillors, all those in favour? It is unanimous, thank you. Um, I just uh, look at this as just an, a, another way where why well, it's important to get our meetings up and running because these are the things that are very important to all those who have been really badly affected over the last few months. So um, this, this will help a lot. So thank you, councillors. Now we get uh, 5.1.2. Now this is, um, this is another lot of um, business that needs to go out the door and, co uh, um, and we'll be helping other sectors of our community. This is our um, Shire Community Project Grants. So um, we, uh, we have um, Ms Pip Pitkin, if you would, would you like to address this or would uh, Ms Johns be speaking? Uh, no, I'll be speaking, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr Mayor and councillors. Um, as you're aware, the East Gippsland Shire Grants program supports a wide range of projects and innovative activities. The program aims to provide local community-based organisations with an opportunity to access funding for a variety of programs in an open and transparent manner. Whilst this latest round of um, this latest round attracted less applications than normal. It's worth noting that most were of a high quality. Each application has been assessed by a panel for eligibility, quality and appropriate budget and dollar matching as per guidelines. I present for your endorsement the suggested list of successful grants and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Ms Pitkin. Uh, this is uh, a question now from Councillor Peltz. Thank you, Ms. Pitkin. Um, just a question about the Board Riders um, Club Incorporated at Mallacoota. I'm really pleased to see them there. It was just the bracket of funding, and I was curious whether this is the appropriate line, given the fact um, it was bushfire recovery um, that they were um, targeting, and, and just um, wondering whether there was another pool of funding that they could get their um, full amount out of um, instead of just the 3500 um, yes, we did talk to them about that as part of the application process and at the time there wasn't another funding round available for them that, that they, their program met eligibility criteria. Um, so um, if that funding became available, are we able to apply on their behalf and refund our, um, our bucket of money for future, for the next round? That wouldn't be how we would normally operate, but if that funding became available, generally uh, community grant applications can't be applied for retrospectively. So if the program's already been um, delivered, that would potentially make it difficult for them. However, if they identified funding that they thought would allow them to either continue the program for longer or continue to run the program in the future or even retrospectively fund, we would certainly be able to work with them to make that application. Okay, and just a secondary follow-up. The um, the one that I highlighted during our um, our discussion um, last week about the female development um, one, would you just like to share with the councillors um, what that what the issue was there? It was um, a privately funded issue. Yeah, sure. So, uh, um, councillors, you may recall that Councillor Powell's requested some further information about the Empower uh, Gippsland Women in Business Events and Networking application. Um, I provided an email to all councillors during the week that provided the reasons that that was ineligible, but essentially um, it was ineligible as a result of business-related expenses. Thank you. Um, just before Councillor Tui, I'm sorry, Councillor Ellis, um, you should have uh, perhaps gone first. So, would you like to? Uh, have you got any questions? No, no, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I accept the uh, recommendations as put forward. Thank you, Councillor Tui. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just in regards to the the difference in in the recommended amount, um, Jody, for argument's sake, the Great Alpine Gallery. 
um, uh, we've approved half of what they asked for. What, what happens, have you any idea what happens in regards to the other half? I'm assuming that they're asking for what was needed. Um, so do you know where, where these organisations go for the, the other portion of funding that they didn't get? So without providing you with specific details in relation to their financial position, we would generally make that assessment based on review of their finances. So if there's evidence that the organisation may be able to pay the rest of that themselves, generally the, the funding provided would be reviewed based on that. That's great. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Councillor Rodino. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so that's, um, this has been moved by Councillor Rotino and uh, a seconded by Councillor O'Connell. Would you like to speak to it? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just very briefly, it's a great uh, outcome. $39,000 worth of investment from the Council, $126,000 worth of community projects. That's all I can say, thanks. Nothing, anyone else wish to speak to this? Uh, no? No, it's a, it's a, it is certainly a great initiative, um, particularly in these times. So, um, all right, councillors, could we put this to the vote? All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you, councillors, and thank you, Ms Pitkin. Thank you. Now, this is um, 5.2.1, um, something that's been in the wings for a little while. Um, it's, this is appointment of, uh, for two positions on our Audit and Risk Committee and uh, I hand it over to uh, Mr. Canizaro. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, councillors will know that we've been looking to um, uh, appoint a couple of candidates into uh, two vacancies within the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, you will note that in on the 14th of February, we had um, advertisements placed in the um, public forum. Um, we um, were um, thankful that we received eight expressions of interest um, because of that uh, advertisement. A recruitment panel was established, uh, which comprised of uh, the mayor, the CEO, and the chair of the risk committee. Um, it was uh, considered at that time of the eight um, expressions of interest that three candidates would be interviewed. Um, the uh, panel uh, narrowed that down to two candidates uh, as the preferred applicants to fill two vacant, the two vacant positions. Uh, the panels recommended the uh, appointees um, to council uh, some weeks ago um, and uh, Having, having advertised the vacant position to the committee and reviewed the expression of interest, uh, there is a recommendation uh, before you, um, and uh, I think we're in a position to now fill those vacancies. Thank you. Uh, councillors, any questions re the um, appointment of these two to fill these two vacancies? Council Reeves. Chair, I'm happy to move this motion. Good, Councillor Rutino. Will I oh, will firstly uh, thank you, Councillor Reeves and Councillor Rutino. You wish to second it? Anyone uh, would you like to speak to this? Well, I'm just wondering if I actually need to notify and read out who the appointees are. Yeah, through Canizaro you, first, so that we can move you, those through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, if you thank you, Councillor Reeves. I think that makes sense. You actually know who you're voting for, Councillors. So. Um, so the recommendation, councillors, is that council in respect of the vacancies on East Gippsland Shire's Audit and Risk Committee for an independent external member appoints one Christopher Badger for the term commencing 21 April 2020 and concluding on 30 November 2022, and two Andrew Roberts for the term commencing 1 July 2020 and concluding on 30 November 2022. Thank you for that. Would anyone like to comment on these appointments? Uh, no, I don't think so. In fact, Councillor Ellis um, had advised, I should have said this earlier, that he would be, because um, he, he can't vote on this at the moment, but he was also, he was declaring a conflict of interest because um, Christopher Badger is known to him on other committees. So uh, that is correct. Uh, Councillor Ellis, you did wish to declare that conflict of interest? Yeah. 
I think he declared that before we started the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm Clearly, I do, I do know Mr Badger, and I'm not voting in this matter, Mr Mayor, so whether I need to declare a further conflict, I don't. No, no I don't think so, but I just to, uh, just to advise the other councillors of, of that, but I think um, everything's all good. We have our quorum, and uh, I would like to put that to the vote. So all those in favour of the appointments. Thank you, councillors. That is uh, unanimous. We, we have two... We filled those two vacancies and it is important um, that we have done that and um, we actually, because of the uh, COVID-19, um, they're already practised on, uh, on speaking to us via Skype or telephone because that was the only way we could do our interviews and uh, I guess be, by the time we have our next audit and risk committee meeting, it'll probably follow in the same procedure. So thank you, councillors. Right, now we have 5.2.2, uh, which is our amendment to the council meeting schedules for 2020. Uh, <laughs> when we get 2020 finished, we'll probably be able to look back and say, yes, we got it roughly about the way we'd planned. But uh, so that could probably be um, spoken to by yourself, uh, Mr. Canazaro. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillors will recall that uh, we've been trying to bed down the uh, council meeting schedule for um, a period of time and obviously with the pandemic as well that has um, uh, required us to amend the schedule somewhat and I put before you uh, also that on the 7th of April the scheduled meeting for the 7th of April 2020 which was um, cancelled. Um, I'm looking obviously in the recommendation to to um, have that acknowledged that it will not be rescheduled and uh, would like to uh, obviously put forward as a council resolution. Um, so the ordinary council meeting uh, for the 21st of April 2020 today uh, was uh, to be held at our OMEO office and, and as we uh, suggested uh, as I suggested earlier um, that along with the 2nd of June 2020 meeting which was to be held in Orbost uh, they were rescheduled uh, to be held at the corporate centre in Bansdale um, so I put before you the the recommendation uh, that uh, we accept the uh, revised meeting schedule and also endorse the cancellation of the ordinary council meeting that uh, was scheduled for the 7th of April and for that not to be rescheduled and um, uh, I'm happy to field any questions. Thank you. I, I, would, I would just like to make comment, um, of course, that's apologies to all Boston Omeo because we would have loved to have held our meetings there but advice due to the pandemic we, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, get the social distancing and and the things that are required to to hold those meetings so it's uh, it's just a it's just another sad event out of this virus and uh, but still apologies to those uh, or Boston Omeo people and hopefully we, we get an opportunity to revisit them uh, in the future so uh, so uh, questions or just to move it no, uh, thank you Councillor Tui Councillor Peltz has seconded. Would you like to speak? No, it is very straightforward, um, and it's it is unfortunate, but um, uh, we have our meeting here today, and it's only through this chamber being large enough uh, that we can get our social distancing and um, and get our business out the door. So, uh, all those councillors in favour? Thank you, councillors. That's unanimous. Right, now this goes to um, one that will probably get a bit of discussion, 5.2.3, which is suspension of the East Gippsland Shire Council Road Management Plan, and I would expect that, uh, uh, that Ms Weagle would speak to this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, the um, report before Council today is to seek uh, Council's approval to temporarily suspend the, the East Gippsland Road Management Plan. Um, having a road management plan is a statutory requirement of all Councils under the Victorian Road Act. And the, the plan really sets out um, the manner in which a council will manage its roads and maintain its roads. It sets standards for repairing defects, the frequency of inspections, and a range of other road management-related uh, matters. 
Um, over the summer, um, with the summer bushfires, as Council is aware, we had 250 individual roads that were impacted by fire, stretching over 650 kilometres. Until these roads are repaired, it's not possible to meet the road management plan standards for these roads. Um, really, this is, and given the, uh, the number of impacted roads, um, completing these repairs will take us at least 12 months. Um, so in situations like this, it is actually possible to suspend the road management plan, um, and there are actually provisions in, within the road management plan that allow for this. This, is, I think it's probably really important to let councillors know that this doesn't mean that we don't um, continue to maintain our roads and, and that maintenance stops. Council still has our road ma maintenance contractor engaged who will continue to maintain our 3,000 kilometres of local roads throughout East Gippsland. It just means that sometimes with some of these fire impacted roads, they will not be maintained to the standards set in the um, within the road management plan until such time as the remediation and repair works are undertaken. It's also worth noting that this, we're not the only council that has um, suspended um, our road management plan. We took some legal advice on this and we understand that um, in emergencies and um, in the aftermath of an emergency, um, a number of councils over the years have suspended their road management plans. So therefore, the recommendations before Council today are to approve the temporary suspension of the East Gippsland Shire Council Road Management Plan until the 30th of April 2021. If we require a further extension, which we hope we don't need, we would bring that matter back to Council to reconsider. So I am happy to take any um, questions on the recommendation of the report. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Ellis, um, we'll s see if you've got a question. None, thanks, Mr Mayor. That's fine. Councillors around the table, uh, questions? Uh, Councillor Peltz, yes. Uh, yes, sorry, Ms Wiggle. Um, I note that you've um, extended the um, period for 12 months, not the six months that was originally in the suggestion um, during our discussions, but um, I wanted just a bit of clarity around um, the fact that if we're... Um, we're actually um, putting a lift on this. Um, where does our our contractor um, or our contractors stand um, in regards to their quality of works that they need to achieve? Um, and if you could just expand on that. Sure. So not all of our roads are um, impacted by fire. So we would still be expecting our road maintenance contractor to maintain our um, other roads to the, um, to the standard that's outlined in the road management plan, but it's also outlined in their contract um, with us. In terms of how we go about managing and maintaining those, these roads that are fire impacted, we will work with our road um, maintenance contractor to ensure that we've got um, an, an agreed understanding of what they can do and what they can't do. A lot of the fire impacts of those roads are really around things like um, impacts to drainage, um, ad additional um, vegetation that needs removing, a lot of the guideposts and signs that need replacing. So as part of our um, response until these roads are fully maintained and fully repaired, is to actually reduce the speed limit on some of those roads and put up cautionary signs. So part of the um, road maintenance contractor's role will be to continue to um, monitor this signage and make sure that it's still stay up and it's still safe for those roads to be undertaken. So this, as we've said in the report, this won't actually impact on the contract with our road maintenance contractor. Um, they will continue to maintain roads and we will reach a level of agreement about how to maintain and to what level to maintain those roads that have been impacted by fire. I hope that answers your question. Other questions, councillors? Would somebody like to move that? Councillor Tino moved and, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Peltz moved and Councillor Reeves has seconded it. Would you wish to speak? Um, I'd just like to say um, it's great that we can, um, that this is something that can actually be done because I wouldn't have thought that it could. So it's, it's um, good that we're sort of taking the initiative and I just sort of hope that um, 
that the standards of repairs and things um, are actually in line with the Vic Road standards, which is a governing body for Australian um, roads and maintenance developments. So um, with that in mind, I'm sure that the contractors and people that are working um, on the repairs of these roads um, will keep that in mind and um, that our officers um, keep an eye on the quality. I think that's sort of the main thing. But as I do travel around the region, there is a lot of roads that have been scorched in areas. And, um, you know, it's really, it's, um, it's really quite um, interesting to see um, what ha the impacts of what the bushfire has actually done to the um, cambers and the, um, you know, the actual road surfaces too. So, and the signs and all the dressings that go with it. So thank you, Fiona. I'm, um, I'm sure that the six month leeway, um, extending it to 12 months is a better option. Thank you. Anyone else to comment? Thank you, Councillor Reeves. Uh, look, I, I'm reassured that our, the safety of our residents and visitors and road users is, um, is not compromised. Um, but this is, this is an extraordinary time. 20% of our roads have been impacted around 20% from my reading of those figures. So it's quite significant and we need to hasten slowly uh, to get, make sure that, um, that we get this right. And uh, this, this is a way of doing it, I think. So councillors, I hope you support it too. Thank you, uh, Councillor Reeves. Anybody else? You are our roads man, Councillor Tui. <laughs> if you'd like a comment, uh, I think it's a good idea. We, um, as Councillor Reeves said, um, our priority is, uh, is our community and, and our visitors uh, when we do get them back, indeed. Um, so, you know, ensuring that, uh, that the roads are repaired, uh, done properly according to the standard um, and according to what the community would expect. Um, but given the, uh, the, the, the size of the job um, and the, the implications in regards to um, uh, the statutory requirements, this is what we need to do until we get things back on track. Thank you. All right, councillors, um, we could put that to the vote. All those in favour? That is unanimous, thank you. Now that moves us to items 7.1 through 7.4. Sorry, have I missed? Aha, thank you. Uh, that's why I said when I was elected mayor, it's very helpful to have so many ex-mayors around the table. Thank you very much for dropping me in it. Uh, <laughs> so, urgent and other business. Is there any urgent and other business, councillors? Ah, uh, isn't, isn't that really great? Yeah, well, after all that kerfuffle, we didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we do need to uh, to uh, move into cam camera. These are contractual um, matters. And Councillor O'Connell has moved that we. Council will now close the meeting to the public in accordance with the provision of section 89.2D and 89.2H of the Lo Local Government Act 1989 to consider items 7.1 to 7.5, as these items relate to any other matter which the council or special committee considers would prejudice the council or any other person in contractual matters. Thank you. It's seconded by Councillor Rutino. All those in favour? That is unanimous. So, councillors, just while we wait for the live streaming. <laughs> 